Welcome to Mac Voices TV. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner, and we are live with the Diablo Valley Macintosh user group in California. Diablo Valley, it's great to see you. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you. This is uh, our first virtual meeting. Well, we've uh, never done this before. We're fortunate in that we're close to Silicon Valley, and uh, we're a little more, uh, it's a little easier for us to get speakers to come to our meetings. But uh, we've been resisting this for some time. Uh, and it's uh, great to use you guys as our guinea pigs, and we're looking forward to an interesting evening. Okay. We, we've we, been doing more and more of these, and they're, they're a whole lot of fun, especially for you know, those of us who would otherwise have to travel, um, where you can just sort of pop upstairs and throw the headset on and do a mug meeting as opposed to you know, spending two days or three days flying around the country. Absolutely. And for those of you listening that can't see, uh, the voice you just heard was Mr. Adam Angst of Tidbits and Take Control, of course. Who else? Adam, it's great to see you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Always fun. Always fun. Yeah. So I guess we're going to start out with uh, just a, a brief overview of what Apple's been up to lately. And, God, that seems like a lot every time we talk, Adam. Do they, do they, have they done anything recently? I, well, um, yeah. Just, I've, I've, you know... <laughs> <laughs> they released the iPad, but that was out three years ago, wasn't it? Or you know, oh no, it's a new iPad. That's right, new improved iPad, <laughs> <laughs> point six millimeters thicker. Yeah. Don't you forget? Did uh, Did you and Tanya get one? We did. We did. I have barely touched it. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean Tanya won't give it up, or you've just been busy? Pretty much, Tanya won't give it up. Uh, um, yeah. She's been updating her "Take Control of Your iPad" book, uh, and so uh, yeah, I, I have. I have held it for approximately 30 seconds, and that's been about it. <laughs> well, it, I can say I've, I've held mine for a little more than 30 seconds, and I'm pretty impressed with it. Uh, I, I would not have thought the resolution change would make that much difference across the board. And I'm, I'm noticing it more just in daily use as opposed to where I thought I would see it in, in videos. Uh, for the 30 seconds that you've had it, uh, what, any impressions? You know, honestly, I really didn't notice in the 30 seconds I've had it. So, so it's not. It's just not fair. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to be curious because with the iPhone 4, uh, which added a, added the Retina display, I, I upgraded from an iPhone 3GS, and it was pretty clearly better. There was no question about that. But it was also the sort of thing that became standard very quickly. You know, I don't look at it now and go, wow, that's a great screen. I look at it and go, hmm, looks like the iPhone screen. And I haven't, you know, every time I've gone back to a, to a previous phone, I don't look at it and think, oh, wow, that's really horrible. So, you know, I think it's better. I'm not going to complain in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I do think people will get used to it pretty quickly as just the way things are and or should be. I don't For what it's worth, one of our members tonight, Bob Skapura, uh, told us earlier during our Q&A session that uh, he in particularly enjoyed the, the new iPad versus his old iPad in that the, fo the existing photos are enhanced tremendously, that the colors are better, and, uh, and the, of course the resolution is 4X. So... Yeah. Um, if the original data is going to be there, so in an app like iPhoto or presumably the Photos app, then yeah, you should just see better, better quality. Um, one of the apps that I'm interested in looking at, uh, once I can rest it away from Tanya, is uh, Alan Oppenheimer's Art Authority, which has, I don't know, 55,000 images of, of you know, great works of art um, collected from various, various places. And that's one of those situations where you're, you're sitting there aiming at looking at things and the higher quality they're going to be the better you know so that that feels to me the kind of thing that we're going to see really you know improving with the new iPad um, and, I, and I hate saying the new iPad I you know I'm, I can't tell you how irritated I am by the whole thing internally or sort of in, informally we just call it the iPad 3 um, but you know it is new but it is not called the new iPad it is technically the third generation iPad Apple's just 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 be playing with us. Well, it's not exactly the first time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see if we can make everyone really irritated for no reason. Yeah, especially that Anx guy in, in Ithaca. Yeah, he, yeah. get him. Yeah. Hey, I'm still taking credit for getting them to remove the space from 3GS. When it when it first came out, it was 3G space S. 
and I threw a fit because there's no way we were going to have this random S, you know, messing up our text for the rest of time. I mean, Mac OS 10 is bad enough, but at least an X has some meaning on its own because of the Roman numerals. So, uh, but they 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 pulled back on that one in a day. So we we lucked out there. Adam, I want you to weigh in on the other big improvement in the in the iPad, the new iPad, the third generation iPad, whatever, um, and that's the camera, uh, because this seems to be one of those things. And it's interesting. I've heard pundits who who laughed and made fun of a camera in the iPad. They're starting to change their tune because this camera is so much better. And I, I almost think it's it's amusing that they they almost had to find something they didn't like, and now they're just being forced to reverse. <laughs> well, it is interesting with the camera. I mean, I still think that the iPad is a potentially slow, somewhat iffy form factor for taking pictures. I mean, you know, you're sitting there holding this thing up, going, oh, I can get it there," um, and. And so, you know, for people who, who find, you know, the big honking DSLRs with the massive lenses awkward, you know, holding this slab for your camera is a little weird, too. But that said, people who have them, for the most part, don't seem to care. Um, yeah, that people, if they have a camera, they're going to use it, and that's fine. Um, in, you know, this one is, is obviously a much better camera. It's a 5-megapixel camera with a five element lens and it records 1080p video and all of that and what I think is most interesting about that is is that the iPad is increasingly becoming a do it all platform and so Michael Cohen one of our one of our, our writers for tidbits pointed out that the iPad's being really big in education and so there it's a big deal for students to be able to take a movie on the iPad or, and then, you know, mix it up with photos and put it all in iMovie and, and, you know, and show it, right, all in one device without having to move things around or switch between platforms or import uh, from, uh, you know, from, a, from kind of some kind of a camera setup. So that, I think, feels to me to be like the most important thing about having a really solid camera on the iPad 3. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, and I think it's something a lot of us overlook because we've got cameras and lights and microphones, and we forget that there's a, a group of users out there, and a pretty large group of users, that would just like to have kind of an all-in-one device. Yeah. And, and with the iPad, with this camera, with iMovie, with a number of other video utilities that are out there, I mean, that's, I don't know if you agree, Adam, but that seemed to be a really hot thing uh, at, at Macworld iWorld was the – the, the video utilities for the iDevices, and now it's just become more important. Yeah, yeah. Um, Global Delight has Game Your Video, which was quite cool in terms of, you know, taking it a little bit away from the, oh, you're going to be editing a video. That's very serious work. Um, and just saying, hey, you want to put out something fun. Um, and there were certainly other packages that would let you add, you know, explosions and, you know, various other effects that, you know, you could have flames in your video. And, you know, I mean, it sounds a little frivolous and a little silly, but on the other hand, you're not making documentaries here. I mean, you know, these are the video equivalents of snapshots. And, you know, and, and so if you can have some fun with them, do the equivalent of, you know, drawing a mustache on someone's, you know, on someone and uploading it because it's funny that way. Hey, more power to you. You know, it's, you know, may not be the sort of thing I have time to do, but that doesn't mean I, lots of other people aren't going to really enjoy it. So the other thing that's happened, and it seemed to, to really come to the forefront today, was the, this issue over the iPad getting warmer than the old iPad, the new iPad, the third generation getting warmer than the, the old one. Does that strike you as just obvious? Because it sure did to me. It's got a heck of a big battery in there, so <laughs> yeah. And it's got a lot more pixels to drive. A lot more pixels to draw, a lot of battery. Yeah, I mean, for people who haven't seen the specs, the iPad 2 had a 25-watt-hour battery, and the iPad 3 has a 40... 2.8, something like that. If I'm, remembering, I'm blanking slightly on the exact number, but it's, it's over 40, 42 watt hour battery. So it's not quite twice as big. Um, and that's how they maintain the battery life. What with the you know four times as many pixels and the battery power, battery hungry uh, 4G modem. Um, that's built in there. So 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 yeah. So I mean, it it doesn't really surprise me. Um, I'm not. Sh I mean, I, I haven't. I haven't. Obviously, I haven't held it long enough to burn my fingers or anything. But um, but it, I will be curious to see if it's one of those things where you really notice it, because you notice it with laptops because they're sitting on your legs. Yeah, that, that's a really obvious spot for the heat to to get you. 
Um, but most of the time with, with the iPad, I'm not sitting there holding it or having it touch me in the exact same position for a whole long time. I'm also very fond. Um, I don't. This is my this is my iPad One, which is why I've, I can actually still show it to you. I have this zero chroma um, case stand which just pops in and out. And I like that a whole lot. And so I don't end up, you know, it's one, it will cover the back. And two, it will, you know, if it, it provides a stand for, which is how I tend to use the iPad more than anything else for watching videos or whatever. So I'm not sure I frankly really care. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, one of the first things I did with my new iPad to calibrate the battery was I charged it the whole way up and it got warm and so what. And then I played um, a video uh, repeatedly to take it the whole way down, to burn it the whole way down until it turned off and then charge it back up and you've calibrated the battery. And it got warm, but it didn't get hot. I mean, I didn't have any trouble picking it up. <laughs> you know, I, I, people are t- acting like you could, you know, you could fry bacon on this. And, and I didn't have that, that experience. And, and I ran it hard for a, a number of hours. Didn't I see something that was like the, the temperature was 92 degrees or something? Uh-huh. Which I mean, ninety-two degrees is warm, but it's not exactly you're not exactly going to burn yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you, out where you guys are, it's probably that temperature whole bunches of the year. <laughs> do you suppose? Do you suppose that it might be the source of that? Might be uh, the people who have referred over the years to Apple as a troubled computer company, <laughs> and one to spread all over the web the fact that one or two of the lithium-ion batteries. Um, caught fire. Uh, well, you know, there's there's interesting the same, uh, thought process behind all that. There's there's a really interesting issue with Apple these days because I mean, obviously, the people who you know were sure Apple was gonna fail any day now, you know, I mean, that hasn't been true for what six, eight, you know, ten years. Well, no, ninety six was when Jobs came back, and then so that was that was uh, sixteen years ago. So. I think it's been pretty clear that Apple's been doing fine for a full decade, and and if not even more than that. And so you know this whole oh Apple's going to fail thing is 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 just totally bogus. I mean the company is huge and and growing growing fast, but I do think there's a certain I don't want to say almost backlash now where. Apple is doing so well in certain ways that you do want to. You know, when they when they mess up in one form or another, I think it is not unreasonable to point that out. That that I think you know we are not in a situation where we are trying to in any way protect Apple. That you know, if they've got no clothes on, then then we should be saying, "Hey, look, you know, no clothes there." You know, really, really, it's not happening. And and they do not, you know, they don't they don't make many mistakes. But they should be held at this point, I think, you know, given the size of the company, to a frankly a somewhat higher standard. Um, you know that I don't know. My my recent one, most recent one was iWork.com, which uh, I don't know if anyone ever used iWork.com, but uh, it was a collaboration service they announced in beta in January of 2009, and made one small change to in September of 2009, and never did anything else with ever again. Um, it was bad at the beginning, and it never got any better. And then they shut it down, um, or announced it was going to be shut down in July. Um, and fine, okay, it was bad. They're admitting it. It was, you know, shut it down. That's good. But what was really problematic was, is they said, oh well, you know, it's okay that we're shutting this down because iCloud takes over for it. And that was just completely not true. I mean, the iCloud does nothing that iWork.com did iCloud has no collaboration features whatsoever. And so, you know, that's the sort of situation where no. Apple needs to be called on that kind of stuff. I mean, they should be lauded for things like the engineering um, capabilities of the iPad 3. And, you know, they sold 3 million of them in, in a, you know, the first weekend. That's amazing. That's great. They should, be, they should be credited for that stuff. But they shouldn't be let off on anything they actually do do wrong. Adam, I don't disagree with that. But don't you think that we're seeing, to this tendency that if, if there's anything that might be perceived by a few people as wrong – that Apple's being called on it, like the 92-degree iPad. It's possible. I mean, it is certainly the case that people will try to um, scare up any level of controversy they can for link bait. You know, you're trying to get traffic, and so if you can say something controversial, then you know you can get people to come and come and leave snotty comments on your on your site. Um, and some 
publications think that's a good idea. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I agree that the, that that trumping up things that Apple has has maybe not done perfectly, or that could potentially be seen as not ideal, you know, that's kind of bogus. But but I do think that there is also this real tendency to want to protect Apple. Oh, and you know, there's nothing bad, nothing bad. And as I, they they're too big and too powerful to get away with that anymore. Adam, I want to get the uh, the audience involved here, but before we do, I want to make sure we touch on the other thing that's happened just in the last couple of days, and that's Apple's announcement of a dividend and stock Uh-oh. buyback program. Yes, yes. Uh, necessary, good, bad, uh, a major break with the past? You all know, the I, don't, I, don't, I don't even play a stock analyst on TV, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did listen in on the uh, on the financial call uh, that Tim Cook and Peter Oppenheimer did on Monday morning, and I wrote wrote an article about that. So I have a you know a fair amount of familiarity with the, with the subject of what they said. Uh, and what I was mostly struck by were sort of these meta messages um, that. So, for instance, my understanding, again, not being a stock analyst, um, is that companies will usually announce dividends, uh, also that they're going to start paying dividends, when growth has slowed. So that putting more money back into the company isn't producing the same level of profit, so they're going to start distributing the money to shareholders in another way. And man, you should have heard Peter Cook. He was, or Peter Cook, Tim Cook. He was just completely, you know, emphasizing over and over again that you know Apple had more than enough money they were putting into innovation and they weren't slowing down one bit. And you know, then they go and announce that they sold three million iPad threes in the first weekend. That hard to argue with him. Um, so that was meta message number one of you know we are not slowing down. Um, and uh, you know the. Another one that, that that you know sort of came out a little bit was, you know, this is you know someone posted this on Twitter. Uh, you know, like under new management. We don't know why, but isn't it sort of interesting that they come out with this really fairly major change in the way Apple handles you know sort of shareholder stuff and stock stuff after you know Tim Cook takes over. You know, I don't know what's behind it, obviously, and they weren't saying, but you know, but that was really really quite interesting that this you know it took place now. And um, and then the other one that I, I was quite struck by is that it turns out that although Apple has about a hundred billion dollars in cash, I mean, a hundred billion dollars. I mean, this is this sounds like something out of you know an Austin Powers movie or something. But um, it's not all in the United States. That a lot of their profits are overseas and are held overseas. And um, they, they didn't exactly get testy, but they were, you could tell they were a little unhappy about the fact that there are significant tax implications for bringing money from overseas back into the U.S. And so all of the stock dividend and stock repurchase program will be funded entirely with money, domestic money, money they've earned in the U.S. and is still in the U.S. And so that leaves them enough, I think, to buy Greece, for instance. <laughs> So, Rick, how about if we get the audience involved? Uh, anybody have any questions or anything they'd like Adam to address? Stump the chump. Yeah. I'll be the chump. Glad you clarified that. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to ask a question? Mobile me and iCloud. Come up to the, uh, come up to the mic, please. Ask them about mobile me and iCloud. What would you like me to ask them about mobile me and iCloud? <laughs> What's it going to mean to me? What's it, what do I do to what alternatives do people who are currently using mobile me have? Uh, that may be settled a little bit in our May meeting when we have sugar sink coming. But uh, yeah. uh, what are your opinions, guys? So, so uh, it's worth keeping in mind that mobile me and iCloud are in fact quite different. Um, that there's a number of mobile me services like iDisk and. Um, it's been long enough now that I've, since I've looked at this, I'm not even, not even quite remembering them. Um, they'll, they'll just go away. So, um, you know, a lot of things like mobile me mail, um, the calendaring, um, shared, con- you know, contacts, being able to sync contacts between your devices. Those just, if once you switch from mobile me to iCloud, they just move over, no problems. Um, anything that doesn't move over, no problems, like iDisk or, you know, um, uh, like photo oh, galleries, uh, mobile me galleries. They're just going to be gone at the end of June. So, you know, that's you basically have to find a different place for those kinds of data. Um, one, 
Joe Kissel wrote our, our Take Control book on iCloud, Take Control of iCloud, and it's got a really, really good um, discussion of what you can do with what uh, type of data, you know, how to make the move, what you might lose, what might be cause problems, things like that. Um, and we've also written a good bit about it in tidbits. So, for instance, um, I was a little bothered because I didn't, I hadn't update, I haven't updated my Mac Pro from Snow Leopard to Lion. Um, my other Mac, my MacBook is updated, and so for a while I was thinking, oh, I can't, you know, I can't, you know, upgrade to iCloud because I'll lose my calendar sharing. Um, and then I realized that, oh wait, I use BusyCal. It just works. Um, so BusyCal just solves all those kinds of problems. Uh, and so, I, on the other hand, Address Book, you know does not work in Snow Leopard at all. I have not been able to find a hack workaround for that yet. So, you know, all this said, I think the important thing to remember about iCloud is a, um, that what it really is is a way of synchronizing your data between your devices. So pretty much anything that you used to do in MobileMe that was about showing data to other people. So again, iDisk, um, the galleries, anything like that, home page in, in uh, iWeb, you know, the iWeb publishing, um, just doesn't come over because iCloud doesn't do that. It's really not designed in that way. I think that's troubling, frankly, um, that you know, on the one hand, you know, Apple is focusing. They've never done collaboration tools well. Witness iWork.com. But nonetheless, I think that that it is a little frustrating that we have all this this kind of functionality that is gone is just disappearing. And the, the only thing I'd throw in too is something Adam said, but I want to emphasize it. It's going away in just a couple months. And if and if you have a bunch of stuff stored on iDisk. Um, you know iDisk is not the fastest thing in the world. So don't think the night before that you're going to download that stuff. Yeah, get it off now. And especially if you have photos up there that that's the only place you have them, get them off now. And Because it, it may take you a while, longer than it took you to get them up there. And the last thing you want to do is lose that stuff. So the, Apple's not going to reverse that decision. I, I, Adam, I don't know if you agree. I'd be shocked if they extended it because no, they've not. given us, what, almost a year notice. I think yeah. it was in October when I had maybe even earlier. Was it, yeah. I, at some point, they—I mean—they announced it right with the beginning of iCloud, if not—if not even before then. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's there's no surprises here, and um, and 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 really, for the most part, iCloud works fine. Uh, you know that you shouldn't you shouldn't fear iCloud in in a significant way. It is a little confusing, which is why Joe Joe's book about you know take control of iCloud has been so popular. Um, to Map from MobileMe to iCloud. If you know if you're if you're just uncertain about what's going to happen to certain kinds of data, what you do if you don't have all your Macs on Lion, for instance. Um, you know, similarly, you've got to have all your iOS devices on four or five. I can't remember the the, the number offhand. I think it um, certainly will work with all the iOS five devices. But that's you know that's, those are the basically the things, and so you can end up with some some orphan data if you're not or orphan machines if you're not a little careful. Yeah, and I've, I've, I'd love to give credit properly, but I heard uh, just today on the, actually I think it was Mac Geek Gab, um, Dave Hamilton and John F. Braun were talking about the fact that address book will sync with Google Contacts, so that's a, a workaround to get all your devices synced together. If you don't don't mind doing it through Google, of course you're giving Google your contacts, but that's another discussion. Yeah, you're giving Apple your contacts. The yeah. the the fact is is that. I've not found a good way to get the address book to sync if you if you do want to use iCloud to I mean you can you can obviously can sync or you can in theory sync with Google Contacts um but that make getting it to sync then with iCloud proves quite difficult. Right. So if you have some some devices that can use iCloud and some that can't then it gets awkward. Yeah. Rick, what's your take on such things as Dropbox and Sugar Sync for the user who Merely wants a vessel in which to store his data. Dropbox is fabulous. Um, we don't we don't use SugarSync. Joe Kissel wrote about it for us years ago, um, but yeah, at the time, SugarSync was more of um, what's the what's the it was it wasn't real time. It wasn't nearly as as quick as Dropbox was, and it, that may have changed now. But what's wonderful about Dropbox is well. 
I mean, to back up a lot. Dropbox can be used for two things. One, again, you can share data in your Dropbox folder between your Macs or multi- your devices, Macs and your iOS devices, or you can share a folder with other people. And so we actually rely heavily on Dropbox for take control because we'll have an author and an editor and usually Tanya and myself all sharing the same folder. And what that means is there's none of this question about when someone's done with a book, you know, oh, I'm done writing for the day, it's it's so-and-so's turn to edit. There's no question that the file is there. You don't have to, to email it or FTP it up to some website or anything like that. It's always being updated in every little save. And the other thing that we kind of, Tanya and I kind of like is, is that we use um, growl notifications so that um, when someone saves a file that we're that's sharing, we get a little notification popping up in the corner of the screen. And so we can just say, oh, look. Someone's working on that book. That's a good thing. Um, and, uh, and so that, that level, plus, you know, you get, you get backups on everyone's machine. Dropbox itself saves, saves you know, um, saves back, you know, saves versions going backwards. So um, I frankly can't recommend Dropbox heavily enough. Again, I haven't used SugarSync um, and recently at all, so I can't say how it exactly compares. But uh, Dropbox has been truly brilliant for our, our business. And I'd echo everything Adam said. I use Dropbox a lot. I do think there's one fallacy that goes on that you have to adopt Dropbox or SugarSync or Box.net or whatever. You can use all of these. You know? I mean, if, if, if it, it gives you a lot of online storage, and if you organize it or think a little bit about it, maybe you use one for one thing, one for another, and kind of segment it out that way. It may not be quite as convenient as you know it could be, but you've also spread the risk around a little bit. So, you know, take, take a good look at all of them. I mean, what's, what's nice about them is, is that, they, you, that all the data lives on your computer as well. So it's not like Google Docs, for instance, where all your data lives up in the cloud somewhere and, um, and you don't have a, a physical copy locally. So not that this is likely to happen, but if some, you know, Google screws something up or someone breaks into your account and wants to, be hara- wants to harass you, they could delete everything. And with Dropbox, you know, worst comes to worst, the files are on your computer and you can back them up like anything else. Now, all that said, I just wrote a, an article about this utility called CloudPull for those people who do use Google Docs, um, which allows you to back up your Google Docs down to your Mac um, as Microsoft Office uh, format files. So, you know, your word processing documents become Word Docs, the spreadsheets become Excel Docs, things like that. And, um, and, and I really like that for getting a, a local copy of my Google, Google data. The, we had a question from an audience member. Uh, is, it, is Dropbox limited to any particular file type? My response was, no, you can drop anything there. But somebody in the back of the room said, no, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds the like a mug thing, meeting. The only thing you can run into some trouble with is that you can um, put applications in Dropbox, and they'll be fine on Macs. Um, but if you go up to the website, because remember, you can access one of the things that's cool about Dropbox is you can access your files on your Mac or up on the website. Um, if you go from the website, an application on the Mac is basically just a folder with a special bit set that turns it into a package. And so I found it rather awkward um, on occasion to, uh, to have to like restore an application from Dropbox because you don't get the whole application. It just sees it as a big folder. That's the only thing that I can think of as being a problem. I haven't seen any other issues with, with different file types. Quicken files. What files? Quicken files? No, I back up, to, I back up Quicken files. So, so what you can run into, and, and I, don't know, I don't use Quicken personally, but um, um, actually I do know of another program, uh, DevonThink, um, you can run into problems where there is a very specific database format and where the application needs to be writing into its database format in certain ways, and it's very important that not change underneath the application while it's open. And so my understanding with DevonThink, for instance, is if you had two copies of DevonThink, each looking at the same file in Dropbox, really bad stuff could happen because both copies would assume that they had uh, the unique access to it and, and they'd be writing into ways that would, would completely corrupt the file. So, so I think you can get away with most file types, but you have to be really careful 
not to uh, ever let anything else touch them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Adam, the question I wanted to ask you that's really important. Is that a penguin in the corner? It is a penguin in the corner. Isn't it obvious that it's a penguin in the corner? I thought maybe we were talking on a Linux box there. <laughs> I, I was a little worried. It's like, okay, I, and I think I see penguins up on your bookshelf, too. Is there a theme here? You haven't seen my penguins? I really have never seen your penguins seen before. Penguins. Well, you'll have to come visit sometime, Chuck. Okay. <laughs> I have hundreds. You have hundreds of penguins. Okay. <laughs> See, folks, you never know what you're going to find out. Guy in the corner, um, actually, is it was a present from a friend from Australia who, in fact, brought him from Australia. You're going to tell me he bought him an airline seat. That's I don't, be I don't quite know. Wouldn't you rather have had some Fosters instead? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I don't quite know why, because in Australia, they only have the really little penguins. I actually went to Australia to see the little penguins, so they don't have the big ones there. The big ones only live in, in Antarctica, so. <laughs> and in Ithaca, apparently. And Ithaca, right. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, Rick, other questions from the audience? Okay, I'll repeat it if you can. Here, you can probably see our member, Mark. One of the uh, things that people wanted it with the uh, third generation iPad was uh, Siri. And I understand that I read some article that there was some problem. Siri is actually getting dumber. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And I didn't know if you knew um, what the future was for Siri in something like the iPad. Were you able to hear the question completely? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so the question is about Siri and the iPad. So the iPad 3 has voice dictation, which is sort of one of the capabilities of Siri in some ways, um, but it does not have Siri's uh, integration with various different apps, and you can just ask or ask questions. And I have to be careful because those of us in the U.S. tend to think of Siri as female, but for instance, in the U.K., um, the Siri voice is male, um, which is very confusing. So, and Apple tries very hard to have not assign gender to Siri. So, all that said, the yeah, there's no, there's no Siri in the iPad 3, and the thought is, um, from those of us who have, have speculated on it, because let's face it, Apple's not saying, um, is, is partly that it doesn't really make sense that Siri is designed as an alternative input, um, or an alternative interface uh, approach for a device that you know, you've got in your pocket and you need to to interact with you know, quickly while you're, while you're out and about. So you, know, you pull out your phone and you can talk to Siri um, and, you know, and ask where the latest, you know, where the nearest restaurant is or something like that. And so the iPad is not really used in the same kind of scenario. The iPad is very much more you're sitting in your, you know, in your easy chair at home and you don't need to have that alternative interface method at as you know, as accessible because you can just pull out the iPad and work on it. Um, you know, it's much easier than than you know pulling out an iPhone and you know trying to tap on it while you're walking down the street. So that's the best we can really come up with. Um, I would actually be curious how many people in the audience have uh, an iPhone 4S and use Siri. A couple. And how often do you really? How often do you really use it? I mean, I I only have the four, unfortunately. Tanya also has the iPhone 4s. I keep getting. I mean, I'm, I'm getting. I'm losing out on the new technology here. So I don't. I haven't really gotten to use Siri much, um, except when. Okay, except when I was using Siri here. One, two, three. And how, and how much? And and people and it's not, not just use it, but use it for real, like using it multiple times every day. Not just play it, but yeah. Most most of the people I've talked to seem to be they seem to use it for like one thing. You know, like a friend of mine um, um, really likes it for the uh, he, he makes reminders with it, for instance. So that's that's one thing. But he doesn't use it for much of anything else. And some people use it for voice dialing, but. It, I find it a little interesting that it doesn't seem to have caught on with iPhone 4S users in a really huge way, and I would guess that it's you know perhaps just not quite solid enough in terms of its results. And the second part of Mark's question was: Is it true that Siri is getting dumber? 
<laughs> I, you know, I, um, I, I can't say, uh, you know, again, not having the iPhone 4S. Chuck, have you, have you noticed any difference? You know, Adam, I don't, I, I don't think it's getting dumber. I do think, though, that the, the algorithm, algorithms they're using behind the scenes have changed. And, and one of the pieces of evidence I, I point to for that, and, and I don't want to start playing politics, folks, so that's not what this is about. But if you remember correctly, at one point, I forget what the question was, but there was an argument about Siri was returning the, the location of, um, of abortion oh, yeah. clinics. It wasn't returning the location. Or, or wasn't. Yeah, wasn't. And so I, I think that somewhere along the way, the, the algorithms, algorithms have been tweaked a little bit maybe. And so maybe there's some, some areas where it's not delivering quite as useful a set of information. I personally, I use it multiple times a day for multiple things. And I can't say that I've seen any real change in, in the, I guess, the quality of results. I still have the same problems in places. I still do Siri doesn't always connect every time, but I don't. I don't think it's getting dumber. I, I. But I also can't say that I have a series of test questions that I've used and to evaluate his or her intelligence. <laughs> what are we talking about here? I think Anne in the back had a question. Well, I was just going to comment that I'd rather than use Siri, what I find way more useful on the new iPad is the dictation feature that actually really works. She finds uh, the new dictation feature in the third generation iPad very useful and it really works. Uh, and compared to Siri, it's much more useful for her. Interesting. I, the, we, again, I have only, only had a very short time with the voice dictation, and, um, and, and Tanya try, has tried it, you know, obviously for, while writing her book, and she had not had a huge amount of luck, luck with it, um, and I didn't either. However, um, Matt Newberg, who we were talking to today, um, has written a lot about, about voice recognition software over the years for Tidbits, and he had said that he found it was really, really good, but he noticed that he, because he's done this, he has a lot of experience with how you talk to these things. And it really is a skill, you know, that to be able to give dictation is a skill, and and I don't want to sort of imply that oh you have to know how to give talk to this device, because it's really a skill in general. I mean, back in the day when you know lawyers gave dictation to their secretaries, that was a skill too, and they had to learn how to do that. Ran into you know many many years ago, I ran into this uh, guy who just graduated from law school who had bad carpal tunnel syndrome, and he was saying that he was lucky because he was a lawyer and it was still ex you know considered acceptable to give dictation, but he said it was not as easy as, he, as you thought because you had to be able to think in these kind of short sentences, short discrete sentences, and, um, and, and, not, and not do what I'm doing now, which is kind of mumbling along trying to get to the end of my sentence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think that's one place that maybe uh, a lot of us who are, you know, over the age of 29 uh, and <laughs> – or something, um, you know. If if we were in the business world, we did learn those dictation skills, and they sort of went away with with keyboarding, and now with Siri, some of that and voice dictation, some of that is back. So we may have a distinct advantage over some other people who never yeah. developed those. I, I mean, I will admit. That, I mean, not that I was in the business world, but uh, you know, I'm 44, and dictation was definitely not something that uh, that was taught. You know, anywhere along my education, um, keyboarding was, and and that was a that was a big deal. So maybe people just a little bit older um, still had some of that. And I don't know, but you know, it is interesting how yeah, you what you learn changes over time as as being what what people see as relevant for the business world. I mean, I do find it fascinating to see kids in school being needing to do PowerPoint presentations now. Yeah, hmm. isn't that the truth? Rick, anything? <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Can we run it down? I, I guess all I can say is thank you guys very much. You put on a great show. Uh, when you were talking about dictation, I'm a retired probation officer, and uh, <laughs> I used to have to dictate sometimes 40 and 50 page court reports. Holy cow. And, uh, <laughs> And, and Thank you. there's a person in our audience today who used to be our office manager, and I have to say she always smiled, but sometimes we were kind of dumb. I haven't seen her since 1991, but she used to have to type the stuff that we dictated, and oh, uh, I gave her a knowing look when you guys were talking about dictation. 
So, <laughs> nice to see you, Candy. <laughs> so, Candy, did he, Candy, did he have good dictation skills? When will this be available for people to look at as a podcast? Um, if if the recording went well, because we have had you know the the issues back and forth, I would say Rick uh, either wait this week or uh, early next week, and I'll drop you, I'll drop you an email when it goes out so to make sure everyone knows. Wonderful, thank you very much, both of you. One thing I want to mention uh, is that Adam uh, has uh, his family, or Tanya, is the one who's in charge of all the take control of eBooks. And uh, they are extremely useful. Uh, even my wife, who is technophobe, got some use out of take control of your iPad. Um, but it's, I think since ended up in the bottom of the canary cage. But, <laughs> so we do have two more questions if you have That's them That's the beauty of eBooks. They don't end up in the canary cage. <laughs> yeah. Rick, you might want to tell them they're seeing only half the audience. Yes, you're only seeing half the audience. The, the room is... Is uh, has filled up considerably since we started. So, I assume we got the most attractive half, though. Absolutely, yeah. There you go. Thank you again, and and good night to the East Coast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Adam, thanks so much. Uh, we will do this again soon. Indeed, folks. Bye now. This is Mac Voices TV. I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. This is part of the Mac Voices Group and a member of Mac Level 10.